Morning, church. Morning. How are we doing? Beautiful, beautiful. So, fun fact, I was actually supposed to do this sermon a couple weeks ago when I came back for Kaylin's wedding, and I told Aaron it was like early October, because I'm taking a preaching class at Johnson, and I have to preach outside of class. So I decided I was going to preach uh, the day after her wedding, and I told him, he was like, oh, that would be great, get it out of the way. Well, then it was about the Tuesday before Kaylin's wedding, and I called up Aaron, and he was like, um, yeah, I didn't tell Tom, so that is not going to work. But then um, earlier that day, Tom had called him and asked Aaron if he could have preached today. So that's how we got here, and that's what it is. So let's pray before we get started. Um, dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us and all these people here, and just um, that these are your words and not mine, and just hope everyone has a great day, and anyone sick or hurting, you put a healing hand on them, and just the people fighting for this country, and the men and women, police officers and firefighters, keep them safe and bring them home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So it was my last year at CIY. Uh, we went to Milligan, and it was a fantastic time. Had a great time. But us boys, we only had our minds on one thing. And that was pranking Aaron, because that's all we did. And so, we've done it for the past few years, but this was our last year, so you know we had to go out with a bang. So we decided that we were going to do a whole bunch of stuff. So like during the week, we're doing a bunch of little things. Well, all of a sudden, Aaron goes into our room when we're all in there, goes to our bathroom, and puts crawdads all over our bathroom. <laughs> so then, uh, there's the boxes that like, soaps in, a bar of soap. Aaron had put one inside my soap box, so my soap had a massive crawdad just pressed all up in that. So then, the next day after that, uh, we pranked Aaron by putting uh, Orbeez inside of his sink and cleaned it all out. Well, they had gotten into the little, like, escape, uh, water escape thing in the sink, so while him and Nate were trying to clean that out, me and Noah were like, oh, let's get him back. So we decided to take the crawdads that he had, and we put them all back in his room. So they were all over the place. We put them in a shoe, ruined, ruined that shoe, and then we put them in his drawers. And the worst one was we put it underneath his sheet. So then when he went to bed that night, he was so mad. <laughs> and that's how we got the saying, crawdad mad. Let's just say that ended the pranks real quick. All in all, God gave us some love that night by showing Aaron, by showing us love that it was a good prank, but probably not at the right time. But looking back, it's a memory that will always bring a smile to our faces. The text today is the one that you've most likely heard multiple times. We will be in Luke 10, 25-37, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, there are many different ways you can take this text. I feel that we can fall into many of the people in this text. For example, the way that the priest and Levite just decided that they weren't going to help the man that had just gotten beaten and robbed. We can do the same thing by passing up some of the little things in our lives. It could be something as little as just passing a homeless person. I know when I do that, I, sometimes I don't, need, I don't give them anything or even give them my attention and look at them. So does that as Christians make us like better than the priest and the Levite in this story? On the other hand, you have been, say you have a super busy day and you have to get this, this, and this done before a certain time. But then you see someone on the road with a blown tire and you stop to help them and you find out they absolutely hate Christians. But then you help them and you, got, you just made their day by stopping and helping them. In this part of Luke, Jesus is giving us parables and how they're going into these things. In this text, you can go many different ways. Today, we're going to go in the way of who does God call us to love? In verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, ask, what must I do to in in inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. So who does God call us to love? After reading this part of the text, you can see that the expert in law is trying to get to Jesus and make him uncomfortable and get him to say something wrong so he can go tell the others and they can get rid of him. Right before this text, in chapter 10, the story of Jesus sending out the 72. And what I see in this story is Jesus is saying that it's not going to be easy to follow, them, follow him. Just like the man he was beaten and robbed, it can sometimes be hard to be a Christian and follow Jesus from the world around just being so um, not Christian-like. Ooh, excuse me. Um, in verse 26, you can see that Jesus answers this question just like you were growing up following in the law that the way it is written. Then Jesus asks, how do you read it? The expert in the law answers the love, answers the question with love the Lord with all your God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your, st- your strength. Jesus answers, do this and you will live. Jesus really focuses on love. You can see that in verse 27 very well. Especially where you see, you can see that God's ultimate desire is that we love. Even though the word love is only said twice in these four verses, it is, manipul- it is directed multiple times in four verses. God is saying here that love is everything, and if you want to serve the Lord your God, you need to do it with love. You can also look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and, or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have the faith that you can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So I remember back my second Believe conference in Anderson, Indiana, and I'm just listening to the speakers thinking, oh, this is awesome, and this is a great time. Me, Me and my best friends, we're over there, we're playing ninja on the side during breaks and having a great time throwing hacky sacks at each other as hard as we can, like dodgeball, 10 feet from each other. But during the last session, Aaron came up to me and asked, had I ever thought about baptizing and giving my life to Jesus? And to be honest, I'd never really thought about that. It kind of surprised me. It made me think, like, have I actually ever thought about it? And it made me just think to myself, and I decided that I wasn't right for the time because it just didn't seem right. After all, I was still just going to be one of those, I was still kind of just one of those on Sunday, I'm a Christian person, but during the week, I'm that kid at school that's always getting in trouble, always not doing the right thing. But at the same time, though, I started asking questions about my faith. And to my family and my youth minister, during this time, I can feel love from everyone around me. (laughs) Excuse me. Uh, I didn't know if it was the right thing to do to ask questions as a Christian. Um... During this time, I feel the love from everyone around me and the decision I made. Then the next year came around as Seattle I moved. And at this part of my life, I was feeling really connected and understanding more and more about Christianity. The same thing my youth minister came up and asked me about doing, uh, doing the wrong thing. This time I asked if I could talk more about it when we got home to Albion. And then he said he would love to. So then we talked and what was happening and I just felt like He really wanted me there and just to talk to me and talk more about Christianity. uh, Wanted me to know the moral love about Jesus. So I made the decision to be baptized. And it was the greatest moment of my my life so far. And I have never once thought that it was a bad idea. I have... uh, Do I still mess up? Absolutely. There's not a day in my life I don't mess up. But I know that if I have Jesus on my side, then nothing's going to stand in my way. When we read this text, we normally don't worry about the first four verses. But once you sit down and listen and read it over and over, you find out that the answer, it answers many questions from the rest of the text. Too often, I believe, we always talk about how it's terrible, how the expert is testing Jesus. But nowadays, it's kind of like, I remember people saying, like, uh, it's okay to ask questions about your faith, and it helps your faith grow. 
Love is always number one if you want to serve God. What you do. Love is always number one if you want to serve God and what you need to do is love God, love people, and serve both. I believe that this is a saying, something to live by. God just wants us to love everything, even though some people you don't want to give your love to, you just got to say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? God's ultimate desire is that we love. We can see in the next couple of verses that God, that love is around us, whether we see it or not, is the big question. There is always a need for love in our lives. God's ultimate desire is that we love. Moving on in the text, we see that God wants us to love unconditionally, and we look back to see what God calls us to love. In verse 29, it says, But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Looking at verse 29, we see that the expert in the law is testing Jesus and asking him about the questions. We can think of this just getting Jesus to say the wrong thing so they can pin it against him. At this time, none of the higher in, higher in demand people didn't like what Jesus was going around and preaching. <coughs> Sorry. In verse 30, we can see that Jesus answers this question by telling a story about a man who was attacked and beaten by robbers. They leave him half dead and within an inch of his life. In this text, we can see that there is much need around us, especially in when we put it in our own lives. Have you ever been around those people? Have you ever been around one of those people that is just so hard to get along with? Like whatever you do, you just don't click with him. I feel like that is how I see uh, the expert in the law with Jesus. Kind of like that kid off the Polar Express that like always asking questions and like, you know what kind of train this is? That guy. That's how I see him. Um, I've always wondered though, like. When the robber got beat, was it like Star Wars? Like, you know how, like, the sand people came and, like, attacked, like, Luke Skywalker? Like, in the valley? I always thought, like, did, would, did he just, like, get attacked? Or, like, what happened? Did he come be homies with a guy and then just attack him? Like, I kind of wanted to know that part. But we will see. That's the question I got for Jesus one day. But we can apply this into our own life by just being the best possible friend, stranger, that we can be, because you never know what someone is going to go through in their own life. And even though they may look fine and happy on the inside, um, you never know what they're going through. And it's always, everyone could always use someone to always just be nice to them. Just be that person that's always there for them, and just always be that person that they can always go to. And just tell them, I'm always just a phone call away, especially nowadays, because I'm always on my phone. That's just the thing. I mean, I've tried to stop, but it's just right there. But, um, or just invite them to a house, to church, and just come invite them to your friends and just be like that. There is much need for, there is, there is a much need around us, and you will never know what you make, you can make someone's day by just being, try to be your best and be like Jesus. Now we have seen that God's ultimate desire is that we love especially to the ones that we may not know. And there is a much need around us for Christians, so we ask again, who does God call us to love? Moving on to verses 31 and 32. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, so too, a Levite when he came to the place, saw him and passed him on the other side. In these two verses, we can see that the holiest of the holy decided that the Jewish man did not matter to him and that he would rather go to the other side of the road and have nothing to do with it. it. A little bit later, a Levite came down, which is right behind the priest in the holy, um, came by, did the exact same thing. So, if you, I put myself into the man who just got beat, and I see that number one and two just came by and said, don't want you, I'd be like, I'm dead. No one's coming to save me. But now, if I survived and saw them, I'd have been like, mm, Jesus is going to see you one day, and he's going to ask you a bunch of questions. <laughs> all in all, though, 
with all of our lives today and with everything going on, I can see you saying like, yeah, I would never be like the priest and the Levite. But then when you really think about it, when that time comes, it'd just be like, yeah, I don't have time for that right now, but I wish I could, but it'd just be hard. I remember about nine years ago, I was going to my grandparents' house for Christmas. We had this old red trailer, single axle, 10 footer, but we had, th- we decided to put three mowers on it uh, sideways. So we were like, oh, we can make it there. So then we're in out, we're going to Portland, Indiana to my grandparents' house, and we're just past 465 on Internet 869 going up, and then all of a sudden, big old bang happens. So it turns out the fender of the trailer had halfway broken off and popped the tire, and then we, were, we didn't have a spare because, you know, we're smart like that, you know. <laughs> didn't have a spare. So then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a semi pulls over and comes and helps us, escort, escorts us, and is behind us to get off at the next exit, and then we call our grandpa to come and bring us a tire. So, and then once we got back, we made it safely, and we got everything fixed, and then there are always nice people in the world, and sometimes it's the most unexpected people, like the semi, who came and rescued us and got us out of harm's way. So how can we apply this to our life today? We can see that it's the little things in life that matter. Even though you don't see it at the time, you can look back and be like, wow, like that was God working in our lives there. When you see someone in need, then you should go up and talk to them and just see how they are. Ask what you're doing. See if you have something in common with them. It could be just a friend that you haven't seen in a while. Give them a phone call. It could be that kid at the cafeteria table that sits by himself. It could be that coworker, just you don't know how they're doing. So you just go up and talk to them. It is so easy in today's world of going and just focus on yourself and not worry about other people's needs. Now that we have seen that God's ultimate desire is that we love, especially to the ones we may not know, and that there is much need around us as Christians, it would be easy, and it would be easy to ignore these needs. So we ask again, who does God call us to love? In verses 33, it says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. When he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the royal pride, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. In this section of the passage, we see that the Samaritan is walking down the same roads as the others. And when he comes to the Jewish man, he does not do what the priest and Levi does. He does the opposite. He decides to go and help the man. And he, does, he takes his hard-worked oil and wine and bandage <coughs> to help the Jewish man and takes him on his own donkey and brings him to the end where he gives the innkeeper two denaro. Uh, a denaro is equal to a day's work of work. So he used two days worth of work just to help this man, plus his oil, wine, and bandage. Then he had, tells the innkeeper that he will be back and pay for any extra expense that he has. Next, Jesus asked the man, which of these do you think was the neighbor to him? And the, law who had, and the expert in the law said the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Real love requires sacrifice on our part, even when it's not convenient. It takes more than just going through the motions you have to go to to present and show love. Just like the Samaritan who went out of the way, stopped what he was doing, and helped the beaten man. We can apply this to our own life by seeing God calls us to love those around us by needing their needs. How can we be more like the Samaritan in today's world? We can be more like this man by loving those who are around us and showing the world that there are still good people left in this world. Also, do not look down on someone just because they believe in something else or don't like the things that you like. Look at what Jesus did in his ministry. He didn't just help the wealthy and the people that believed in him. He helped the people that were sick, hurting, people that hated him. I'm not saying you need to be like Jesus and do miracles for people and cast out demons of people. But you can always be there to help someone who's sick, hurting, 
and just give them a helping hand and help them out. All in all, in this section of the passage, God calls us to love those around us by meeting their needs. Overall, over the course of this text, we've gone through four main points. And the way that we get together in finding the way to whom God calls to love. All of this brought together, we can see that God is trying to call us to love in this passage. And he calls us to love our neighbor. And we know now that our neighbor, who our neighbor is, and how to treat them. And if you do all these things, you will be blessed with this. In this, You will be blessed with the word of God. If we all brought all these things into our lives right now and did not and did them, then we would, be, we would be the people that everyone wants to hang out with. You'd be the cool guy, the nice guy. You'd just be that person that everyone loves because you're always there for them, and you're always having a good time. I used to think everything was all about my life, and nothing else mattered. But now looking back, I can see that that was doing nothing but holding me back. Now I see that once you start living your life for Jesus, it completes you. And it doesn't matter at all it doesn't matter at all that it's, uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy at all. That means that it is going to be, there's going to be bumps in the road, some very big. Just know that you'll always have Jesus do it all. Overall, throughout this text, we have seen the answer to whom God calls us to love. And how, once we start to figure out whom God calls us to love, it makes the joys of life mean so much more. So I'm going to leave you today with the same question that Jesus ends the parable with. Go and do likewise. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us, and thank you for these people here, and just hope that we all have a great rest of our day, and be safe, and thank you for Thanksgiving, and the people that have been around us for the past week or the weeks coming, and just thank you for everything that you do in our life. Amen.